Hello, everyone, and welcome to the World Championship Final 2013. It's Shahar Shenhar against Reed Duke. Let's meet them in their own words. Reed Duke, United States, 52 pro points last season, playing Jund in standard, playing hexproof in modern. Shahar Shenhar, Israel, 53 pro points last season, playing blue white red in standard, and playing blue white red control in modern. There you see Shahar Shenhar. He is 19 years old. He is up against Reed Duke of the United States. One of these two will walk away with a title and 40,000 US dollars. Reed Duke will begin with a Glade cover scout. His deck is hexproof. BDM, tell us about the matchup. Well, first of all, I just want to point out that Reed Duke is such a nice guy that he will not even tell a little green, white, and blue lie and call it banned hexproof. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, the, the matchup is the Hexproof deck, Glade, Glade Cover Scouts, Slippery Boggles, lots of auras, 27 auras, I believe, uh, versus, you know, the sort of slower, controlling blue-white-red deck. And one of those auras is a Hyena aura, so plus one, plus one. And there's another Glade Cover Scout backing up, and already Shahar is getting hit. Yeah, and this matchup is... Estimated by most, including Shahar, to not be in Shahar's favor. I, I think the fact that Shahar doesn't really have a good way to get rid of an uh, Umbred creature is the main point. Shahar does, after board, especially have access to Supreme Verdicts and a bunch of other, and Pyroclasms, you know, the, the sweepers. But Umbras have the clause that if it would be destroyed, instead of removal damage and destroy this aura. Right, there was a flurry of activity as we were looking uh, at how a, a one mana creature with a one mana Umbra would interact with an engineered explosives, but then, then it ended up being pretty clear. Yeah, it, as it turns out, the explosive destroys both, but at the same time, the, the totem armor does replace the destruction of the creature, which means that Reed would end up with a Glade Cover Scout still. There, yeah. there you get a look at Hyena Umbra, and you can see what we mean when we say totem armor. If it this was from Rise of Eldrazi. Yeah, so all the damage gets removed, the aura gets destroyed. So Shahar is certainly countering this, taking the opportunity to use Spell Snare, even though he has Mana Lake available, just yeah. because Spell Snare has so few targets in, in Reed's deck. Also, Mana Lake's basically a hard counter. Reed's almost <laughs> never having four or five <laughs> lands in play. And, and certainly wants to like, get an unflinching courage or something like that with the Mana Lake. Yeah, that, that could happen, uh, even though it, Reed is likely to cast more cheap cards, and unflinching courage isn't what he's looking for as much in this matchup, though if he has it, he'll certainly cast it. When I watch these guys play during the uh, first two days uh, of World Championship action, Keen Sense was a was a was a beating yeah, for Reed Duke. It just you know came down early and drew him a couple extra cards. And Shahar is used to being the guy who has all the extra cards in the matchup. Right, and, and th that's the reason that Reed's playing it. It's one of the most important cards in matchups like this because Shahar can actually take three a turn here for a couple turns. Reed doesn't actually have burn spells. Please. So, whereas a keen sense example, for example, if this spider umbra was a keen sense instead, Shahar would be in a lot more trouble. Yep. It is not to say that Shahar is in great shape right now, but he, a keen sense would refill Reed's hand and give him a second wave of things if Shahar was able to deal with the first wave. Rank her up, my guy. Smash in. Yeah, when you're countering a spider umbra, you know you're <laughs> not in great shape. Yeah, Shahar does not have much uh, much of a choice here, though. See the one copy of Ajani Vengeant appear in Shahar's hand. In the semifinals, he took down Ben Stark by three games to one. And, and Ajani Vengeant would be a terrific card normally <laughs> if this was a, a traditional aggro versus control situation. Yeah, I mean, Shahar would love to, you know, Lightning Helix, you know, using Ajani's minus two on the 5 3 trampler. He'd be but pretty happy to use <laughs> if he could only use the, the plus trampler, one. But yeah. Even just locking it down would be nice, but that, that's not in the cards here. Yeah, again, uh, his, his creatures have hexproof, so he can target them, but his opponents cannot. And even though Shahar has access to a mana leak and a spell center via his three snapcasters and a cryptic command and a Johnny, he's still <laughs> losing to a, <laughs> a pair of Glade Cover Scouts with uh, some one casting cost auras. Now, his hand is the envy of control players and magic traders everywhere. <laughs> Cryptic Command at least interacts with what Reed's doing. Shahar can use it to, to fog, to tap both of uh, Reed's creatures. He can also use it to bounce an aura at a key time. In we go. And now here's Snapcaster Mage from Shahar. Okay. 
Here he gets to target the mana leak and then Reed basically could not let him use it but not playing anything else. Bashar's mm. not that unhappy with nothing else being cast either. For sure. First strike. So first strike, let's do things in the proper order. And then a trade off. Bashar's already at five. Yeah, that didn't take long. Yeah, even even a draw without a resolved David Coronet can still do a lot of damage very quickly. It's been so good for Reed, it's tempting to ask why we wouldn't be no, wanting to you. play a deck like this. Uh, the main reason is that, as you saw in his, one of his games against Josh, he mulliganed a lot. The deck does do that. And it's not always the most interactive deck, so if your opponents are actually playing a faster, faster combo deck, you could be in trouble. You, you could almost argue that it's better for a small field like this than it is for a, a larger tournament. Well, this is a, a somewhat metagame-dependent deck, and if you can choose, you know, pick the right metagame, which this was. I mean, Reed is very happy with his blue-red-white matchup, and that was half the field here at the World Championship. Mm. So we've seen one, two, three, four, five cards sitting on top or under uh, a Glade cover scout before now from Reed Duke. But here in the final, he's making do with Hyena Umbra and Rancor. Plus two, plus O, oh, and trample. So he's holding a core spirit dancer and the unflinching courage, but he had a mana leak, uh, sort of eligible to be flashback. <laughs> yeah, which and Shahar's actually fine with it not being flashback because he has more snapcasters to use it on. Kind of running out of time to use those snapcasters, but they they are there. Interesting. He's getting a mountain, so he wants to cast another snapcaster mage. Just get it out of his hand and get it in there as a potential blocker. Right, maybe, maybe, well, I guess. Well, he's got a, a cool line here, which okay. involves Cryptic Command bouncing the Hyena Umbra and then trading for the Glade Cover Scout. The only problem is he got a mountain, so he actually can't cast Cryptic Command unless he draws another blue source here. So it was, it was a good start, but uh, I think he actually may have needed to, no, I guess he couldn't even afford to pay the two life because of Rancor, so. He's in a tough spot. He just had to hope to draw an untapped blue land that didn't require him to pay life. Mm. Which was fairly thin, but, I mean, that was his best shot of winning this game. And he is at four. Facing down four points of trample damage. He can, he can trump with the Snapcaster. He can stay alive, but he's still going to have a hard time actually uh, making any progress. He really needed Arid Mesa to be Scalding Tarn in this game. So here comes the Planeswalker, a Johnny Vengeant. Just going straight to Reed's face. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm at 12 and you're at 7. 12 to 7. It would be funny to see the burn plan work twice for uh, <laughs> Shahar. Yeah, hey, th this isn't the matchup where it's most common, but uh, <laughs> Reed has not not drawn a lifelink enchantment, and his lands do cause him quite a bit of pain. So Shahar is actually threatening to do a little bit of damage here. He, oh, yeah. He, he He's hits got Reed, a lightning bolt. He hits me to ten, and he can he can mm -hmm. double bolt next turn off Snapcaster. So yep. he he actually could be just two points short of actually racing Reed. <laughs> that is another rancor that Reed has drawn into. Re Reed would have loved to land here. Yeah. So then I'm flinching courage, uh, not available to him. But there's rancor number two. So Shahar still can draw a, an island here and, and kind of survive with a cryptic command. It has to be actual island, though. <laughs> it can't be a fetch land. It can't be uh, a shock land. It was a shock land. <sighs> it was hallowed fountain. Mm. So that, that second rancor uh, kind of making Shahar pay the price for playing a three-color mana base with, you know, all these fancy lands, though, <laughs> as necessary as they may be. We can. Again, you can put Reed to two, which is closer than this game looked like it was going to be, much closer, but. Go. Reed. Shahar perhaps hoping Reed will uh, decline to trample over the Snapcaster Mage. Attack you. <laughs> And pick him up. And that is 1-0 to Reed Duke. Look at my scary planeswalker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Over there. Reed's been walking all, all over those today. <laughs> he really has. Um, I want to ask both of you gentlemen, we're about to take a look at Shahar Shenhar's sideboard here. Uh, at Paris Worlds 2006, there was an allegedly 100% unwinnable matchup for Tiago Chan 
against Gabriel Nassif. Gabriel Nassif was going, proclamation of rebirth, was going to gain hundreds, maybe thousands of life, maybe break the computer along the way. And the night before, Tiago Chan sat down with our own Frank Carsten and concocted an extraordinary plan um, a, involving lightning angels and, and going beat down with this control deck, essentially, um, and found a way to eventually, over an incredibly long three and a half hour grind, win one game <laughs> out of the four that was that quarterfinal matchup. Now, I'm not going to ask you to find me the way for Shahar to win this whole match necessarily, but let's take a look at the sideboard and start concocting the plan where the sideboard can help. I, I think we actually saw the plan in the main deck there a little bit. Yeah. Like, I mean, it is to go aggro, right? There's certainly some aspect of that, and Lightning Helix and Snapcaster Mage play a big part in it. Um, uh, obviously, you know, we talked about the engineered explosives, and uh, the, at the desk they were talking about the pyroclasm. Yeah, and Shahar's going to be looking at boarding in the Pyroclasms, Supreme Verdicts, and Engineered Explosives. Even though they're, they are quite bad against the Umbras, the eight totem armors that Reed does have, if Reed doesn't draw one of those particular cards, Shahar can potentially wipe the board with uh, of Reed's creatures. Shahar also has the option to bring a Thunderbolt Hellcat, and I think racing seems like one of his best bets. If Reed doesn't draw one of his lifelink auras, then a bolt into a Restoration Angel into a Thunderbolt Hellcat could provide a pretty reasonable clock. And even though Shahar's the control deck, I think the game going long doesn't really necessarily favor him when Reed has just these combination of cards that Shahar really can't beat. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but again, he was, you know, maybe two points short of being able to steal that game. Yeah, and that would have been uh, quite the theft indeed. But yeah. uh, <laughs> Shahar can also uh, potentially uh, trim down on the number of counterspells he has. Counterspells aren't really what you want in this matchup. And then also look at maybe uh, not playing all the Snapcasters. They are very good. I, I don't think he's going to cut any, but he does know that Reed has rest in peace and potentially uh, Graf Digger's cage. Right. You may be wondering why we're not showing you Reed Duke's sideboard. Well, that's because he's not bothering. <laughs> um, his sideboarding uh, features precisely zero of the 15 cards he might have done. So his sideboard of four Leyline of Sanctity, one Graf Digger's Cage, two Rest in Peace, three Stony Silence, two Dismember, two Path to Exile, mm. and one Suppression Field are right where he began the match. But not so fast, Rich. So he did bring in Rest in Peace against Shahar during the first two days of this event. But not here. But not here. But he, he did bring it in. Hmm. So he has to at least uh, maybe show Shahar some sideboarding? Well, regardless of whether Reed does or does not actually sideboard, he's going to pick up his deck and pretend like he does. There's no cost to doing that, and you really don't want to give away free information. Yeah. But but again, and speaking of free information, I mean, Shahar maybe said, oh, well, I learned something there. Maybe Reed's like, well, he's obviously thinking about my rest in peace now, so... Yeah, and and, bring it and, and and like Paulo said in one of his limited articles, if you never side, if you don't even touch your sideboard, your opponent's not going to play around a card like Fog or Ancient Grudge, cards that are never in your main deck. Reed needs to at least touch a sideboard to have Shahar respect the chance that he could. Yeah, so it looks like Shahar is bringing in eight cards. He's going to play Vendillion Click, two Thundermore Hellkite, two Pyroclasm, which, as you say, BDM, the desk we're talking about, two Supreme Verdict, and one Engineered Explosive. That's what coming in looks like. Uh, a couple of Sphinx's Revelations have gone. I think Twice has gone. Uh, all three Paths to Exile have gone, because, unsurprisingly, Hexproof guys don't really care about Paths to Exile. Um, and uh, so uh, Shahar Shenhar, with plenty of sideboarding to do, Reed has decided to stick with his original list of 60, at least for this game, too. Go into a more aggro control kind of deck for yeah Shahar's Shahar. forced into it pretty much I mean he's got sweepers and he's got a bunch of haste creatures so that that's kind of his plan for this matchup the Vendelian clicks actually kind of nice you know you, we, we've watched Reed maybe suffer for a turn or two trying to get to his daybreak coronet to the position where he could cast it and it's such a game-breaking card that maybe the the click can you know stymie his plans a little bit yeah Vendelian kick the fact that it's a disruptive element and is a three power flyer which Reed really can't block or interact with it makes it worth bringing in, and you you like the main deck ones as well. Boggle. <laughs> <laughs> Slippery boggle for Reed Duke. Leads off. They're very tasty if you can get the skin off. It's getting a blade <laughs> on them that's the problem. That's why I prefer steak. Not so much a problem. I had a steak here the other day that tasted like it could have been made out of bogle. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not, I'm not even kidding. It was, it was not the best steak. Okay. I could definitely was hexproof too. <laughs>
turn two for Shahar Shenha. The Israeli national champion, remember, led them to the top 16. Couldn't quite make it through to the top eight. Congratulations to France, already the winners of the World Magic Cup earlier today. Raf Levy, Timothée Simono, Stefan Soubrier, and Jan Guthman, your winners there. So I sense that Reed's going to want to draw extra cards this turn. The real question is, does he want to lead with Rancor or Keen Sense? I, I was just going to ask you that same <laughs> question. One uh, of those might get countered. Right, and he has to play around Mana Lake. I think the more valuable one is the Keen Sense, which would make him want to lead with the, the Rancor, but looks like he's running out the Keen Sense first. Uh, well, fairly well, academic as Shahar can counter either. <laughs> But I do like the double enchanting turn rather, or per perhaps the enchanting and just playing a second Boggle turn, though. I think the double enchanting is going to be a little safer. He knows Shahar has Pyroclasms. Running two Boggles into a Pyroclasm is not what you want to do. Yeah, and, and that's how he's played this deck throughout the weekend, is really just, you know, here are these eggs, carry them to Grandma's. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, just has another Red Riding Hood if things don't go well. And he, Reed does have the Core Spirit Dancer in hand, but... I think adding two enchantments to the board rather than playing the Spirit Dancer is a little more aggressive of a play and plays around removal a lot better. Did she carry eggs to Grandma's? I don't remember that part of the story. Well, that wasn't red, Little Red Riding Hood. It was like Little Green <laughs> Little Riding Egg Riding she Hood. Eaten. Okay. She didn't make it there. <laughs> so Shahar, glad to trade a Snapcaster Mage for a Slippery Bogle here. <laughs> Unlike, uh, as you said, <laughs> most dealers. <laughs> Snapcast a mage from Shahar Shenha. It's the blue doom blade. <laughs> I mean, this is actually like the blue so edict, right? Like, like, I mean, yeah, yeah. X proof creature. This is just. So Re Reed's going to get a card back. He gets a rebate. And then he draws the <laughs> ranker again from his graveyard, essentially. So. It wasn't quite as bad as it might look. It's, it looks like a 3 for 1 ends up actually being parody, but. <laughs> Shahar has a lot more Snapcaster-type cards than Reed has Hexproof Creatures. So if Shahar could trade his removal one for one for Hexproof Creatures, he'd be thrilled. What I want to know is how many people Reed killed with the Dryad Arbor with a bunch of enchantments on it this tournament. <laughs> I mean, imagine <laughs> it, it happened. It, 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 is, it is a number greater than two. That's turn number three going by for Shahar. He, he, he was definitely, I mean, I don't want to say gloating because Reed Duke never gloats. Of course not. But he was dryly recounting the joy of killing someone with a multiple mm -hmm. enchantment uh, dryad armor. So Shahar, his hand is a little deceptive. He's got a couple of electrolyzers there that are soon to be cycled away. So Reed has decided whether he wants to just lead with another Bogle or go for the Core Spirit Dancer plus Aura, which Shahar really hopes he does because Electrolyze will, yeah. will go ahead and kill the Spirit Dancer. And, and while... If, for example, he did that with Rancor, uh, he, you know, Reed would still draw a card from the Spirit Dancer, but the, the Rancor, Rancor would get countered. Right, the Rancor would would be lost to the Mist of Time. Looks like it's a Boglin time. And following that up, Ethereal Armor is the more high priority enchantment to get onto the Bogle because uh, once once yep. you have the the Bogle has the Ethereal Armor, then it survives Pyroclasm. Right. Reed may not want to play it this turn, though, just on the off chance that Shahar has Supreme Verdict. Shahar does have two Verdicts and two Pyroclasms, so Reed has to decide which one he wants to play around. Rich, have you, would you ever consider playing Lightning Talons in this deck? <laughs> <laughs> plus three, plus Norton, but why? You don't want to catch Lightning on a Bogle? <laughs> oh, my good. No, Reed decided against taking his Talons to Amsterdam. <laughs> oh, dearie, dearie me. Somebody help me. So Shahar clearly not in, in, in the possession of a Supreme Verdict or a Pyroclasm. Pyroclasm for sure he would play if he had it. There's a chance he could be saving the Supreme Verdict to try to get a few more cards, but that is a bit aggressive against a, a deck with eight Umbras. So here we see the Core Spirit Dancer. He does not yield priority. No, Reed, Reed's going to draw a card off the Ethereal Armor. Shahar is going to be happy enough electrolyzing this Core Spirit Dancer, he but he still has this Bogle to deal with. And draw a card. So I'm going to draw a card if that's all right with you. Shahar is going to want to kill the Spirit Dancer now. Reed could potentially play a land and another one mana aura, in which case he would get an extra card off a Spirit Dancer that's going to die anyway. 
Shahar thinning his deck, probably getting a tapped land. I'm gonna electrolyze the core. Okay. Yep. So the core spray dancer is gonna die. Although <laughs> Shahar says, I'm gonna electrolyze the core. Yeah, Not actually gonna show you the electrolyzer. Didn't say I was gonna do it this turn. <laughs> no, just, just something I dream of occasionally. There it is. You draw a card and I draw a card. Mm -hmm. mm, let's both draw a card. That sounds like a better deal for the guy attacking for a five here. <laughs> Indeed it does. And Reed may still have another ethereal armor in reserve. It looks like he's well, not in reserve anymore. Looks like Reed's bashing for the full amount. Oh, well, that was a convenient draw. <laughs> Is that a supreme verdict? It's even better. It's an explosive, so. There we go. And Char doesn't have a particular reason to play it at instant speed. He can. I mean, he's going to have to use, do it when Reed attacks, and Reed is going to just attack with the Bogle before committing anything else to the board. But either way, I mean, there's no Crozen Grip running around. If this is a, a <laughs> if you saw that your opponent had Crozen Grips, you'd definitely want to just be using this. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say, no split second here, please. Another Core Spirit Dancer um, for Reed. So a Ranker is going to come back to uh, Reed's hand. So he's going to be able to recover from this again pretty quickly. Yeah, it's it's a slightly hindered by the fact that Char has a Lightning Bolt, which is the perfect card here, since Reed's going to play Core Spirit Dancer, and if he doesn't have any other options, he's got to try to put Rancor on it, in which case Shahar can Lightning Bolt it. So part one of that uh, little explanation occurs now on your screen. There's the Core Spirit Dancer. Here's part two, Rancor. There's part three, Lightning Bolt. <laughs> You've played this thing before, haven't you? Count counters the Rancor. It does counter the Rancor, so Reed does get to draw a card off the Spirit Dancer trigger. Rancor goes to the graveyard, and it will actually stay there. Yeah. That leaves Reed with a hand of... Looks like another Core Spirit Dancer. Which I believe he just drew. And then a Dryad Arbor, another land. But he's got that Horizon Canopy in place, so Reed is on his way back to, to recovering, and Char is at a fairly low life total, but this is the kind of game that Char might have an advantage in. If Char can get to this point and Reed doesn't have a handful of cards, Shahar could c start coming back. And what, what does Shahar have to work with in this uh, situation? Unfortunately for him, he doesn't have a whole lot. He, he can start attacking with a Celestial Colonnade, but he really wants to draw like a Thundermaw Hellkite or <laughs> a Snapcaster Mage is not bad. It can electrolyze and kill the Dryad Arbor as well as draw Shahar another card. That sounded like a fairly uh, brutal uh, menu there for Shahar. Yeah, that sounds pretty excellent all around. So did, did Shahar bleed any information there by the way he handled himself after his draw step? I wouldn't be surprised if Reed did pick up on that. I'm not, I think Shahar hasn't played so many spells that he should be able to recall them at this point. I don't know if picking up the graveyard is something you really want to do there, but it's, it is within Shahar's range to pick up his graveyard when he doesn't have Snapcaster Mage, so <laughs> it, 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 I wouldn't be 100% sure where I read. Also, Reed is kind of in the, in the place where he just has to play his cards. He, he doesn't really have the luxury of playing around a whole lot. As we saw, as he played a Rancor on a Spirit Dancer that died. Normally, you, you really want to safeguard Rancor as much as you can because it's your best enchantment in the face of Wrath. But when, when you only have one enchantment in hand, you just have to play it. Looks like Reed's on an Umbra here, which... Well, pretty reasonable. I mean, Shahar's a lot of untapped land, so you can never be too confident about casting into that. I mean, casting into one mana, he ha forces him to have Lightning Bolt. Now Shahar could have Cryptic Command, Snapcaster Mage, Electrolyze, all these different cards. Though I don't know, again, that Reed ha really has the, the wiggle room to, to play here. He can also put the Umbra on the Dryad Arbor, which does yeah. force Shahar to kill the Spirit Dancer or kill the Arbor and not really get yeah, buffed. Targeting the Dryad Arbor and draw a card. Again, right the way through the day, yeah. Reed's been okay. so okay. precise okay. about everything that he's doing. It's just terrific to see everything announced clearly, waiting for draw steps to make sure nothing's happening, just confirming that it's his turn, snap. that he can untap. Snap. We're going to see a Snapcaster now yeah. from Shahar. Okay, so I'm at 16. And I like the sequence of events. I mean, I think killing... Killing the Dried Arbor and getting the Umbra off the table is good, especially Shahar then has more answers to the Spirit Dancer. He just has to hope Reed doesn't have another stream of enchantments. Re Reed just drew a Rancor. Well, <laughs> that's not good for Shahar. 
So that's going to be plus four, plus two on the Spirit Dancer. Yeah, which ends up, ends up trading for Celestial Colonnade, perhaps, but... Well, you're assuming nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> Comes off the top here in his next three draws that he can draw between now and next turn. Yeah, I mean, that that, that is a, a, an optimistic view of things for Shahar, but that's really all he has to cling to here. <laughs> the cliff is approaching. Duke leads 1-0. This core spirit answer will lead to will lead to problems left unchecked. I yeah. mean, there aren't very many draws Reed has that aren't good with a core spirit answer in play. And almost a half almost half his deck triggers the the spirit answer. There's the rancor. Past the turn. I've had core, two core spirit dancers in play before. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> I'm sure it bad. is. So you're at 15. Yep. <laughs> Just checking that I can quintuple boat you. Shahar has done it before. <laughs> yeah. Looks like a lightning helix from Shahar, which lets his snapcaster trade for the spirit dancer. Doesn't really impact the colonnade trade, but it could be more impactful once Reed plays another aura. That could change the math somewhat, depending on what it is. Right. But most of them grant first strike, so. Uh oh. <laughs> oh. Shar hasn't announced Rick. a spell. He's he's gotten pretty close, but <laughs> he's like waved waved the lightning helix about the table in an excited fashion. I mean, he's, he's he sent out a save the date. He's revealed the information to read. That that much <laughs> is clear. Yes. I, I don't believe he has to play the lightning helix at this point, even though he got very, very close to doing so. He, he did you know do a quick power toughness check and realized <laughs> this is not gonna work. Uh, th oh, <laughs> this thing has four, huh? That's a lot. I'll attack with my Snapcaster Mage. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the attack with Snapcaster is a lot less intimidating now. I mean, Reed wasn't going to block anyway. It, that plays into Pyroclasm, sure, plays into Bolt, yeah. plays into Helix, but Shahar guaranteed he didn't block. What if that was a, a sick bluff by Shahar to get I, the two points through? I just <laughs> really wanted to make sure that you didn't get him. <laughs> but no that, that, no, that that was not what was happening. No. Draw a card, this time off Horizon Canopy. I mean, so many good draws in Reed's deck are great that he's really got to take a look and, you know, try to peel another enchantment, though it looks like he may not have done so, in which case the Colonnade actually will hold back the, the core Spirit Dancer. Shahar has the possibility of, uh, looks like the Spirit Dancer is coming in. One reason that trading is good here, though, is Reed can trade, play his other Spirit Dancer, draw a card off the Rancor, getting a lot of cards out of the same Rancor. And that's... Exactly what. Shahar is pretty much forced into blocking there. I, I don't think you can just take it and go to two. And it's interesting that uh, if Reed still got a land in hand, he, he could have played Slippery Bogle and put the Rancor on that. But because it's to the point where Shahar doesn't have that much removal left, he'd rather just have a 4 4 than a 3 1 Hexproof. And here comes an Umbra. <sighs> More cards. So Just an engine of doom. This is narrowing down Shahar's potential uh, draw steps here. Oh, there's another lightning helix. Which, thanks to the Umbra, doesn't, doesn't quite do it on the, on the Spirit Dancer. No, but is he, is he close enough now that... I mean, he's going to gain a bunch of life. He can go helix, helix, straight to Reed's face. Shahar goes up to 12. Reed goes down to 5. That's enough to keep Shahar alive for a turn. Yeah. And then Shahar goes, hey, let's draw a bolt. Let's have a snap cast. I or, mean, or a Thunder Mile Hellcat would sure. actually be his, his preferred method of yeah, delivery. Yeah. <laughs> Reed can get a couple extra cards off this Keen Sense. He, he has to be worried about Cryptic Command here. That's one of the cards that could potentially get him. But I think he, he realizes he's just in too deep. Cryptic Command is really bad for him, regardless of how it plays out. Mm hmm. Keen Sense draws him a card and then does indeed go on what is now a three aura up Core Spirit Dancer. And then in it comes. Looks like a nine power to me. It's plus six just from the enchantments. Plus seven, eight, plus nine, yeah. 
Yeah, so Char's, I, I mean, Char can win here. He can just double Helix Reed, go to three, take Reed to five, and just hope to draw a Thunder Mile Hellkite. Yep. Or a Bonfire the Damned. <laughs> <laughs> no, a different standard, standard <laughs> staple. <laughs> Sorry. You could also block with the Snapcaster, but I think just double Helixing is, is reasonable here. So the helixes have occurred, no blocks. You take nine, you're at three, you draw birth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Shahar goes down to three. There aren't that many cards that Reed can draw that actually stop what Shahar is, wants to draw to kill Reed, so I, I think it's mostly up to the, what the top card of Shahar's deck is. Slippery well, Bogle. It's a, it's a bigger range if he doesn't have a blocker. Correct. The, 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 the blocker, which I assume Reed is going to play, is, is definitely uh, what he needs to do to protect himself from a potential lightning bolt or lightning helix. He played Bogle, Hyena ar uh, armor. So yet again today, we're into top deck magic. This time it's Shahar Shenha. He's got Reed Duke at five. He's at three, in desperate trouble, one nil down. What is on the top of the deck? That's what we're waiting to Electrolyzing find the out. bolt been, it would be a nice one too. Deed. Deed it would. It's possible that he could have drawn a spider umber there. Oh, Spider Umbra actually is relevant because it, it gives it reach and <laughs> Thunder Mile Hellkite taps flyers, but <laughs> not he, things he knows better reach. than to mess with the spiders. <laughs> <laughs> the powerful spider lobby. <laughs> they are listening at home. Right. right. Here we go. Shahar draws and it is a land. I believe that is Celestial Colonnade. Past the turn. All right. Shahar's got an uphill battle ahead of him given that uh, <laughs> this game is, is probably not going his way. No. Daybreak Coronet now has gone into uh, Rejik's hand. It looks like the window is closing on game two here. That's Shahar. He said he was a clear underdog, and nothing we've seen so far has changed that perception of this potentially perilous matchup for him. There is the spider umber. Not that it's going to be doing much blocking. Now we're letting Reed, uh, you know, demonstrate how his deck works, <laughs> just in case we weren't clear. <laughs> we didn't get a chance to do a deck tech with him here. Or actually, we did. I was going to say, we really did. I can't wait to watch that back. In <laughs> Smash. And it is 2-0. And when you start off on a plan, Brian David Marshall, a year ago, when you are in the depths of a darkened hotel room at three in the morning, writing down everything you've ever done wrong in your life, or that's what it feels <laughs> like to you, when your peers have pretty much dismantled you and said, you have been weighed, you have been measured, and you have been found wanting to quote a knight's tale. Well, this knight saddles up and gets to work. And this is a year on, and now he's right on the verge of everything he could have hoped for. Yeah, a absolutely. I mean, we talked about it at, at the start of this weekend uh, that, that, you know, he had something to prove. And, uh, and, and, and at every point, it's not, you know, you know sometimes you, you, you get the idea that you want to manufacture a narrative, but it's something that Reed has talked about at every turn. Yeah, and he came into this event wanting to, you know, re redeem himself to prove himself. As far as I'm concerned, and I think I can speak for most of the players, you know, he already proved himself this year, but it's great to see him doing well in this event right. and just proving it to him to himself, even if he didn't prove it, like, even if he already proved it to the rest of us. Right. Just, just the fact that he got here on the merits of his Pro Tour season. Yeah, that, that, that already speaks for itself. I yeah. mean, every, every single player here has, has proven something tremendous just, just by, you know, by being among the only 16 players who have the opportunity to play in this event. Yeah, it is a, a tremendous honor, and... Uh, you know, I know every player who played in the event is hoping to re repeat that next year, and as well as some who, who didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and what odds on a Dmitry Budakov building on a 6-6 six and six from this year and coming back next year and doing better again? He did uh, a lot better this year than Reed did last. Certainly all eyes will be on him in Dublin. That's where he's going to use his... Uh, he got an invite from the Magic Online Championship Series, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he, you know, players had an option to use it in San Diego or use it in Dublin. Uh, he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I like value. I want to start my invitation off at the beginning of a Pro Tour season, not towards the end of one, and, well, and kept his uh, invitation for Dublin and 
you know, obviously he's going to, you know, he had a good time this weekend. He's looking to get back here as well. Yeah, that, that's a wise move, both, uh, you know, using your pro trend right for the beginning of the season. And also just the fact that he, he went 6-6 six, six at, at this tournament. That's very difficult. I mean, I went 5-7 last year. I'm certainly, <laughs> and, and I didn't feel like it was an easy 5-7. I felt like it was difficult just to get there. And 6-6 uh, <clears throat> six, six means uh, he has six pro points. Which is, which is a good start. Yeah from the zero he had coming in on his career, too. I mean, this is someone who, who never really played uh, outside of Magic Online or Mag the Magic Online uh, Championship. Yeah, and, and, and even w winning a Magic Online Championship is very difficult. Even qualifying is, is difficult. So I, I don't think anyone really doubted that Budakov deserved to be here, is, especially since every person we've seen come out of that Magic Online Champion slot you know, has been quite good. I have a message for you, BDM. This is uh, from Adrienne Reynolds on Twitter. Mm -hmm. She says, thank you, Top 8 Games, for correcting MTG Rich on Reed Duke's demeanor after the semifinal. That poor man looked like he needed to remember how to breathe. <laughs> now, I wonder what he'll be like. Now, do you think it will be overwhelming if he wins this, that he has literally triumphed in the way that he has dreamed of? Or do you think it was because of how tense that match was that we saw him struggle so mightily there. If he wins this 3-0, will he be our usual calm, even keeled read that we're used to? I think he has to go into this one expecting, you know, the, you know, he can't be the only Magic player in the room who doesn't think he's a 90% favorite here. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think even though if Reed somehow loses this, he will be disappointed, you know, he won't show that disappointment, you know, all that well. And if he wins, he'll be very happy, but he's a restrained guy. I mean, he'll crack a smile. He'll talk about how grateful he is to, yeah. to, to do well, but, you know, we all know he deserves it, so it wouldn't be a problem if he did, you know, want to revel in it a little bit. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that uh, there'll be no shortage of entourage wanting to come onto the stage uh, to cheer him and pat him on the back if he does do it. But let's not forget that Shahar Shenha still has the capability of causing an upset and it's been a day of astonishing tops of the deck incredible plays back and forth and now reed duke will look to seal the deal and, and if you look even though reed did win the first two games shahar was two points short of winning game one as surprising as that and, may sound and, and a top deck winning game two and yeah game two was close for a number of turns and then it came down to the final turn even so it, it these have not been as lopsided as we were led to believe Block the heck out of your fly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Umbras are, are the actually the number one target Shar wants to keep off Reed's creature. Unlike say the the matchup between Reed and Josh, where Josh cares mostly about you know Daybreak Coronet and other you know the lifelink auras, the Umbras really stop all of Shahar's best ways to interact. Looks like Reed is on one land here. With oh, looks like a Dryad Arbor as a second land. That's a risky land to play. He's got to be thinking about whether to even play it this turn all kinds of ways for that to be uh, thoroughly dead. And Shahar's hand is good. I mean, he has the Electrolyze, he has the Cryptic Command, and he has the Supreme Verdict. So he has the tools he needs, especially if Reed has a slow start here. There it is, Dryad Arbor. I like how he puts it up front where it can be easily found when it comes time to kill things. Which uh, <laughs> is, Shahar would be glad to oblige this turn, I think. Electrolyzing a, a Dryad Arbor on turn two is kind of like the dream. <laughs> What was the uh, tap a green creature instead of paying its casting cost to give it plus two, plus two? Oh, right, right, right. gather courage. Gather. <laughs> yeah, he needs, he needs a gather courage or just a mutagenic growth. <laughs> but. So let's see, does Reed ha if Reed has another Umbra here, then he could be in okay shape to, to, to ride out a Supreme Verdict. If he doesn't have an Umbra and just has to play a Ethereal Armor or Rancor, then Shahar Supreme Verdict will be successful in killing the scout. Yeah, there's a spider umbra there. As well as a wooded bastion, so Reed has lands. He can cast spells now. <laughs> He's no longer under rule of law. Green, green. Sure. Spider umbra. Sure. Yeah, cool. Okay, you're at 14. Another electrolyze for Shahar. And Shahar's option, his best option now is to 
to go for the end of turn cryptic command, your Umbra, untap Supreme Verdict away your Hexproof. How much does Reed want to go for it here? He's got the Umbra protection, but Shahar has got a lot of cryptic commands in his deck, and if Reed, Reed just you know piles on the coronet and the ethereal armor that he's got, then we could end up with you know Reed bending most of his action right. in exchange for a cryptic command, which will also cycle and a supreme verdict. Yeah, play play an aura, you know, counter it and bounce. Yeah, Shahar has got a ton of options. He can tap the the scout and bounce the spider Umbra if he doesn't want to take damage. He can just bounce the spider Umbra and turn and draw a card. It all depends what Reed plays pre-combat, if anything. I mean, Reed might elect to just attack. He might play a Core Spirit Dancer and, and Ethereal Armor, or as we said before, Daybreak Cornet and Ethereal Armor for just like the full-on moving in. Either way, he leads uh, with a double-cost spell, so. I mean, keep in mind, this is all not terrible for him, though, entirely. Oh, uh, it looks like he's floating two off the Void of Bastion because Filter Lens do work that way. Mm -hmm. On it goes. So it looks like Daybreak Coronet then, since you don't really want to play a Spirit Dancer after you play Ethereal Armor. Mm -hmm. yes. So, so can, can I read it? Now Shahar's path is, I, I think, clear. He he needs to get the Spider Umber off the field because he's going to cast Supreme Verdict. He, he, his options are, to, does he want to draw a card or take a million damage? Because his Cryptic, one mode is locked in. It's bouncing Spider Umber. Right. The second's either going to be drawing a card or tapping Reed's creatures. And, well, in this case, creature. I think in, I think paying life for drawing a card is, is powerful, but I think this is a I few mean, too many lives. Let's, <laughs> get, let's get it tapped, surely. Yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> I mean, we're talking about. How much about, of my 14 life will I lose here? We're talking about 11 life here. <laughs> and Reed, Reed knows what's, uh, <laughs> what's on tap here. Yeah. There we go. And this is why Reed deck is so good. Yeah. He still has Rancor, he still has Spider Armor, and he has a Core Spirit Dancer. He's he's actually a one man away from drawing two cards and having a six power creature in play, seven power creature even. So um, he, it's like he's barely missed a step. This is the second huge weekend in a row we've seen when Craig Wesco won Pro Tour Dragon's Maze, where. Oh. oh. Spell Snare. Wow. Shahar's last, last relevant play on the, of, the, <laughs> of the turn oh. cycle is a pretty good one. Spell Snare does stop Reed. Now, now Reed might be stopped in his tracks for at least a little <laughs> while. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, cool spirit dancer. Well, luckily for Shahar, he's assembled a Snapcaster Mage and another Spell Snare. So, so it looks like he's in an Electrolyze. So it looks like he, he's actually in position to, to control the game for a little while. He does need to eventually get around to killing Reed, though, if he wants to have a chance at winning the game. Reed has played some long games with this deck where... You know, there's like this huge exchange of resources early on like this, and then both players just go into top deck mode. And yeah, and, and that's the key is that even though Shahar is stabilized, Reed's not that far away from rebuilding. And Shahar does, again, have to have a pretty quick clock on Reed, or Reed does run the risk of just, you know, coming back. And he plays the Spider Umbra instead of playing the uh, Rancor there. I think uh, Spider Umbra is the most valuable card early, but later in the game, you assume Shahar's gone through some amount of removal, Rancor becomes a little more important. Wasn't long ago, that battlefield was full of Reed Duke creature plus all sorts of auras. Yeah, Cryptic Command's really good. Now yeah. it's full of empty. <laughs> Cryptic Command is a very strong card, and uh, part of the reason this deck works so well. Uh, you know, and it's, it's, I mean, yeah. you know, uh, casting costs aside, just. Would you say the best counter ever printed in terms of its flexibility? Yeah, the, the fact that it's not really a counter, it's just, you know, it does everything. So Shahar sees a, a handful of auras, which I imagine yeah, his best shot is just to let, let him keep all the auras. Like, if, re, if you cycle away one of those auras for a bogle, Reed's, Reed's, <laughs> Reed's in much better shape. Yeah, I think. Mana Drain has 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 a, a, a slight uh, obviously <laughs> a I, slight case there with Cryptic Man. I was assuming you would go there. But uh, you know, besides Mana Drain and Force of Will, Cryptic Man stands pretty high in the in the counter regimen. 
But like even in a situation where this spell can't be countered, or you know, it's it just oh, it always finds a way to do something. Uh, this is looking very, very good for Shahar. Yeah, Pyroclasm, maybe not the play uh, when you have a Vendillion Click in play, but uh, the Snapcaster Mage can deal with whatever the next creature Reed draws is, and Shahar has a, a pretty fast clock. Reed has also a lot less creatures to draw than he actually has auras to play on them. Mm. Well, yeah, Reed, Reed does a surprising amount of damage to himself early on with his lands. Too. Yeah, Horizon Canopy, Temple Garden, Fetch Lands, and he, he can't really pay attention to it either. He, no, he no. has to just play them untapped and, you know, fetch for a Temple Garden just to make sure... He, he cannot slow play. No, it's not like the control decks that can fetch tap duels. You know, may get basics if they need to. Shard now debating if he wants to up the clock by just playing Snapcaster and Electrolyzing Reed or potentially double bolting him. Looks like he's just going to go for the kill with the Snapcaster Bolt. Snapcaster Bolt you. And the math works out perfectly. Good game. All right. Shahar Shenhar is on the board. Good for him. No sweep. And now he's only two games away from becoming world champion. They're two quite big games, mind you. And in game four, Reed Duke with super explosive I do crazy things to you deck is on the play. And Shahar's, you know, even though he's two games away, he's uh, one game closer than he was, and he actually gets a chance to play those two games. H had he lost this one, it would not have been uh, much of a contest. So this is this is the first time Reed gets to be on the play since game one? And that, that is impactful. It, it limits Shahar's counters early to spell snare mostly, since by the time Shahar's third turn rolls or second turn rolls around for Mana Leak, Reed probably has a pretty good idea of what he wants to play and has already probably played it. So let's take a look at one of the cards that, boy, do they ever want you to be blue, with a blue, a blue, and a blue in the mana cost. It's one of the best counter spells ever. That's Cryptic Command. Let's take a look at, uh, oh, I'm going to... Third best, according to <laughs> Scott Vargas. <laughs> well, uh... I mean, it's, it's, when you're competing with cards made in you know 1994, <laughs> then you, you and, and maybe slightly later, you you have a lot of competition. But it's certainly the best counterspell in, of this this decade of, <laughs> of the modern card. Frame. Right. Yeah. Do you have a full list? Like when he says number three, <laughs> if I asked you what's 82, are you like a, do well, you have alley eight? Not, not 82, there? but I probably have have eight since uh, we, we frequently count down to top eight uh, <laughs> on on our Magic TV there. So indeed. So the thing is, it is just choices, 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 and that's what makes it so special. Ha has appeared in 82. <laughs> well, it, it's a little unfair that you know you, you collect the statistic about cards that have come out a year or two ago. You're like, oh, sure. eight lists here, 16, 82. <laughs> 80, 82 is still a lot. That is a lot of deck lists. I mean, that's that's just like a, that's just consistency over time. Yeah, and and you know, to be fair to Cryptic Command. It's not legal in as many formats as these new cards. At this point, those 82 are, you know, going up as slowly and slowly, so it has to rely on modern, you know. It's not really a legacy card. Right, right. It, it, it exists actually almost solely in, in, in modern. Yeah, and it still pulls its weight there, as, as you can see by Shahar and Ben both making top four with it. How, how do you feel about uh, original art Cryptic Commands versus the... Foil textless cryptic commands. Uh, I don't think it's remotely close. The original art's way better. <laughs> I, I, I don't like the full art cards. Maybe that's just me. I, I like my cards to have text on them. <laughs> it, well, especially when it has, you know, choose two of these four things. Well, I, I, you know, I don't really need the help with cryptic command. I've cast it enough times that uh, I, I can certainly remember what it does. But in general, I, I like my cards to say what they do in case my opponents wonder. I mean, when you. Can you imagine, you, you sit down for your first Magic tournament, your opponent's like, all right, well, I'm going to play this card. What it does, and he explains <laughs> a cryptic command. <laughs> what exactly are you going to say to them? So I, I, ha I have uh, a foil cryptic command in my commander deck, and I've actually had that, you know, the foil <laughs> full art. Yeah. And I've actually had that where, you know, you play with people with various levels of experience. Like, okay, what is your, you know, Japanese commander do? What does this textless card do? <laughs> yeah, but uh, cryptic command, it's, it's pretty funny that, it actually does everything blue wants, and in a way that might 
not be allowable for blue. The fact that it can, f mainly the fact that it can fog any attack or bounce enchantments and artifacts, these are things blue is kind of supposed to have problems with once they resolve, and Cryptic Command is uh, <laughs> maybe a little too powerful and versatile to, to show up anytime soon. I mean, we saw it deal with a hexproof creature. I mean, it was... Yeah, it, it, it certainly did. It. When you're playing a deck with Cryptic Command and someone asks you, well, what's your out to this? The answer is always, well, I also have Cryptic Command. <laughs> So there you see it, and now you are looking at a table that Reed Duke hopes will be filled on the right-hand side by Awesome. Now, does he have what he needs? Hyena Umbra there, Keen Sense, he's away. With a turn one, it is Slippery Bogle. If Reed draws a second land here, you know, we, we are completely, you know, off to the races. If he only draws one for a, for a while, it might give Shahar enough time to get a foothold in this game. But Let's Reed see. has everything else he needs. Let's see what he does. He's looking. He's being very careful because he always is. So he's going to, I believe, play Keen Sense here. Yeah, if, if oh, you're no, sure. No. the Umber instead. Mm -hmm. I think he's worried about Pyroclasm. And just says, I'm going to attack in. He's not getting greedy. If, I think he figures Pyroclasm is one of the easiest ways for him to lose this game. Though by not playing around, or by playing around Pyroclasm, he's actually kind of playing into Mana Leak here, since he would really, really rather resolve, resolve Keen Sense and be drawing extra cards, but he's not really going to have that option. I, I'm sure Shahar's Mana Leaking this. That's exactly what's happening. Away it goes. Land, and I'm going to pay, because sure. I want to put this Ethereal Arm on there, and smash. The second land really does ex expand Reed's options, to. so I think Shahar is... <laughs> the one who's in trouble now. I, one of the things I really like about how Reed plays this deck is he lets the sort of tight mana, you know, needs for mana dictate how uh, he plays his lands before and after casting spells. Yeah, it gives your opponent the, the least amount of information. If Reed's stuck on one land, which he was for a turn, you know, playing the one mana enchantment first and having your opponent counter it, it's pretty easy to, to end up w resolving the cards you want to resolve. Shahar passes the turn, and this could be a big one for Reed Duke. He's 2-1 up, and he's looking to become a world champion. He's getting clicked. He is indeed getting clicked, which means Shahar can look at two Daybreak coronet, a Coronets, a Keen Sense, and a Core Spirit Dancer. And the two Coronets, kind of like Shahar's nightmare scenario, he can't, he can't take both, and it's going to leave Reed with you know, a, a really quick clock and a really very hard to deal with creature, especially since that Hyena Umbra is sitting there protecting the Bogle from both Supreme Verdict and Engineered Explosives. Is, is it essentially a one-turn clock in that Reed is going to get to finish his turn, put it on, smash, and then next turn, that would be it? Well, Shahar does it the Vendillion click, so he, yeah. he can buy himself an extra turn off that, but things are looking quite grim. So, there's Daybreak Coronet. On it goes. Smash, Vigilant, amongst all the many other things. Three, Take six, it, says seven, Shahar. Eight. Yeah. Six, Take six, eight. Six, Shahar Shenhar is at six. Reed Duke is six points away from completing one of the most remarkable 12-month comebacks ever seen. That, that was actually Shahar's probably his best draw because Restoration Angel lets him block with Vendillion Click and then blink it. Reed yeah. doesn't yet have Trample. So, Reed, you know, this game has, has got... A ways more to go. Shahar's going to get to see a few more cards. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, which one is this? Uh, which one is this? Yeah, keeping track of what all the your opponent has is <laughs> often a task here. I don't know these cards. I'm not sure if you can block a flyer. <laughs> <laughs> In goes the Vendillion. Click. Pass the turn. Oh, no. Um, I guess that attack tells Reed mostly that Shahar is planning on casting a Cryptic Command. That's the, the, the card I would expect most. You can't really put Shahar on Restoration Angel because if Shahar has Restoration Angel, he does want to block with Vendillion Click and blink it there. So I think the attack indicates Shahar's mostly looking to cast Cryptic here. I don't know if Shahar realized the lifelink on Daybreak Harnet and there's a discrepancy over life totals. That could be it. I, I don't know if Shahar, uh, Shahar uh, thought that Daybreak Coronet granted Trample or something along those lines. I think he may have wanted to wait on the Restoration Angel, though he might be saving Restoration Angel to to, to flicker Snapcaster Mage later, since Snapcaster Cryptic is another thing he's got going. Reed says, I declare my attack. This is going to be no, how about you don't? So it gets tapped. Shahar draws. It's an Electrolyze. And, and the tough part about using Cryptic is you really need the Cryptic to bounce the Umbra to set up the Wrath or Explosives. The, the ideal situation is end of your turn. 
get rid of the Umbra. And, and then untap and Yeah, like we saw we saw in the last game, Shahar's now two cards off that. He needs to find that, the Supreme Verdict, or I guess the, the, actually just the, the Supreme Verdict or the Explosives. The Pyroclasm is pretty far from working here. But he does have Snapcaster Cryptic, so he's got a couple turns here. Pretty important, I think, that he doesn't attack with a million clicks. So yeah, he, he decides to... This turn, he actually wants to use the Restoration Angel. So he might have just been planning on using it this turn instead. Reed in a spot where he doesn't really need to play any more auras. And this actually is, again, why Reed is not doing so badly, even if Shahar deals with all this, is Shahar's having to throw away cards over the next bunch of turns, whereas Reed gets to stockpile cards for a second wave. Is he going to target himself here with the click? No, I'm saying... Oh, it all happens. Yeah, it all happens. He might. He, he can cycle the second Snapcaster that's not targeting Cryptic Command which doesn't do a whole lot for him here. Reed's hand is almost immaterial. Shahar really needs to, you know, to find what he needs to find. So, you know, worrying about Reed's second wave of activities is some, a luxury he can't necessarily afford. Looks like the Snapcaster, since it can already cycle the Electrolyze, Shahar's content just to look at Reed's hand and, you know, take whatever it is he thinks will be the toughest to deal with next. So, two creatures, two auras. Shahar looks at his four cards in hand. Doesn't he have to push the Umbra here? Yeah, yeah, he's got to take the Umbra, I think, just because a second Umbra is going to make it very hard to deal with uh, the, the Bogle this time. It looks like he's taking the Spirit Dancer. Mm -hmm. So now Reed will get something else instead. Shahar could be looking at racing. He gets to attack for six. He gets to Snapcaster Cryptic and then attack for eight. He gets to Snapcaster. Well, the, the Cryptics run out at that point, so he's hoping to chain <laughs> Cryptics. If, if he does chain enough Cryptic commands here and he keeps Reed from getting another lifelike kit in, we could be looking at a, you know, a pretty tight race. Have you ever sort of fallen across the finish line? where you sit there and y you just so desperately want it to be done that you, you're just clawing to find <laughs> those last points. I mean, I'm looking at six life points. I think I'm six life points away from being world champion here. Yeah, and Reed really, really wants to make sure he, he does everything in the right order. And in this case, it looks like he's running out a second Boggle with a second Umbra. Playing them first to pump up, yeah. or playing them after combat, and then yeah. deciding not to, to play his last card here. So Restoration Angel and Vendillion Click. Actually, it turns out the board's completely fair. There's two creatures aside. <laughs> Shahar untaps. Uh, an Explosives for one here would still be pretty amazing. He's drawn a Lightning Bolt. It would, it would knock off all the Umbras, all the engineered, uh, Ethereal Armors, and it, would, and it would make the Daybreak Coronet fall off as well. In comes the team. So Shahar's actually drawing very live just to drawing that by itself. Six points of flying power. Passes to Reed. And Shahar's actually assembling enough burn, a, an <laughs> electrolyze and, and a lightning bolt that this is a competitive race. Those will be the last spells he plays. I assume he needs all his mana for Cryptic Command here. Yeah, he, yes. he's going to need a Snapcaster Cryptic. He does get to draw another card off that as well, since I don't think he... At this point, if you're, if you're committing to the race, which is, you know, very reasonable, you do need to just draw a card. You need to assemble maybe another burn spell here. Reed's hand is getting to the point where it doesn't actually matter how many enchantments he loads up on all these creatures. Shahar is just not concerned. And if, he, if Shahar draws another Cryptic Command as well, that, that is almost just game. So let's see what Shahar does. So Shahar's two points short, except he <laughs> he's drawn Lightning Helix off the Cryptic. Okay, so then an island. Looks like Shahar's actually forcing another game here. Wow. We're gonna see a game five in the World Championship he final. He has to attack with the Snapcaster Mage, though. If he if he doesn't attack with Snapcaster Mage, Reed Reed goes to nine, and then Shahar does eight. So now Reed can prevent one by getting a Dryad Arbor, but the preventing one still puts him to 14, 8, 0. Wow. 
We're going to go the distance. Really? Anything before blocking, asks Reed. <laughs> I mean, Shark can do the extra point by electrolyzing the dry arbor, but he doesn't really even need to. And I think he knows it. There is lots of excited <laughs> chatter in my headphones. I don't know about yours, boys, but goodness. And Shahar beating this draw is impressive. If he can beat this draw, I, I really think they got a good bolt. shot in this matchup. Snapcaster Mage. Bolt and Helix. Are you casting it? <laughs> good game. It's 2-2. Two, two. The matchup that was meant to be 95-5 in Reduke turns out to be 60-40, but to somebody. Are you casting it? Has been called. <laughs> All right. You can't say fairer than this, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world. It is 8.23 here in Amsterdam. We have been on air for 11 and a half hours. We have been on air for 50 hours this week. We've given you 12 rounds of 16 of the finest players in the world across four formats. We brought you the best that 71 Magic Nations can pull together across three more formats and two more days. We've brought you a Sunday that featured the top eight, the top four, and the World Championship title bout between Raph Levy's France getting the job done at the last, claiming the title. And then we brought you the World Championship semi-finals. You saw Ben Stark and Shahar Shenhard go at it. You saw Reed Duke take down Josh Utter Layton. And now, deep into the European evening, we hope it's prime time for you back in the United States and around the world. You're probably sitting up in bed screaming, it's 5 a.m., I want to go to bed. But wherever you are, thanks for being with us and joining us for the biggest match of the week. It's game five of the World Championship final. And one of those two is going to take it all home. And you'll see it all right here with Brian David Marshall and Louis Scott Vargas sitting alongside me. Boys, it's a real privilege to be here, isn't it? Oh, my God. That's Definitely. So <laughs> uh, we just saw, I mean, Shahar Shenhar was just in an O2 hole not a <laughs> couple minutes ago facing down a lethal hexproof army. Yeah, and it would look like a fairly bad matchup. But he's able with, you know, the help of Cryptic Command and then, uh, you know, the Restoration Angel Vendillion click shenanigans that have <laughs> carried him through this tournament, actually race a Daybreak Coroneted Creature, which we haven't seen before. No, we, we've no. seen it dealt with. We've seen it, you know, Reed eventually dying after that. We haven't seen it actually get raced. It was on the board the entire game. Yeah, and, you know, Shahar Shenhar looking to uh, fittingly become a teenage world champion in Amsterdam. The home of the last oh, uh, teenage wow. world champion I can remember, Julian Nauten. Yeah, and uh, and also looking to become the second Israeli world champion. 2007, Yuri Paleg, New York. Yeah. Yeah, Julian won the first worlds I attended, though not the first worlds I played in. It was in San Francisco, so I just went, but <laughs> I was not qualified. <laughs> that was that was a pretty amazing tournament. Yeah, it definitely was. I, I I was a spectator for you know just about all of it. Did you look at the big bathtub of money? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I I missed that. I... There was a there was some sort of display there to demonstrate how much money had been given away on the pro tour. Oh. I think it was actually like a plexiglass. Oh, thing. that's right. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we <laughs> dropped <laughs> Julian in it at some point. Fair enough. Did he, he got out eventually, right? Yeah, he did. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, now he's a cook. A chef. A chef. It's not a cook. I know. If you're over a bar, if you're if you're doing the. Uh, Grilling. <laughs> Fair enough. Might be cut. We, I heard it was terrific. I haven't had a chance to go yet. Yeah, some of the some of the guys from coverage, along with David Ochoa, went a couple days ago, and they said it was pretty amazing. The players have their opening hands for game five. Please. Oh, Mulligan for Reed. Okay. Have we heard Shahar yet? Uh, looks Three, like Shahar four, five, is satisfied. Six, seven. <laughs> so Reed is looking for a good six. Um, 
why don't we just take a look while Reed's doing what we hope will be his final shuffle. Let's take a look at a card that has been so good for Shahar uh, during this day, and that is Lightning Helix. Red and white, super powerful. We've seen what's on the top of the deck. Well, Lightning Helix is often the answer. <laughs> and uh, we'll see if we can take a little look at that one for you as we wait for Reed to complete his mulligan to six. There's a Lightning Bolt, a Restoration Angel, and a Snapcaster Mage to go with three land and an engineered explosives for Shahar. But there is Lightning Helix. Just very briefly, you see Craig Jones famously top decked this card to win his quarterfinal at Pro Tour Honolulu in 2006. Um, and the quintessential red white card. Pink Bolt. <laughs> I don't think I knew that. Th that's, to be a fair. that's a cuter name than the effect the card has on the game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's, it just changes your math completely. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the fact that it's a six-point life swung off two mana means there have been a lot of people who've made uh, lethal attacks to find themselves actually just dying to helix you, untap, attack you, helix you. Okay, big moments. Let's get back down to the floor. Reed Duke is looking at six cards. What's he going to do with them? Staring at them, really. And yeah, and, and I mean really staring at them. And Shahar's hand is, is quite good. Shahar, this is... Shahar has an engineered <sighs> explosives in his opening hand. It's actually his best card in the entire matchup. And Reed's going to five. Shahar just raised a very slight eyebrow when that happened. Again, his towel of looking around. Where am, where's my parents? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's like, hmm. Shahar will get enough high fives, but so will Reed, I mean, at the end of this yeah, match. Oh, of course. Just two tremendous competitors here. And uh, as it turns out, they're also playing for the right to buy the other person dinner. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the top four has agreed that the, the winner of the top four has to treat everyone else to dinner, so. Uh, that's, that's very civilized. I, I don't think it, they really think about that right now, but sure. th they will later when people are racking up the appetizers. <laughs> mm. Freaks. <laughs> yeah. Is that the face of your 2013 Magic the Gathering World Champion, or is it this man, Reed Duke? Five cards coming your way for Reed Duke. Please be at least reasonable. There's a forest, there's an unflinching courage, there's a horizon canopy, there's another land. And a path to exile, it, this is... Reed's, Reed's shown his willingness to mulligan before. I, I would not be surprised if... Uh, it's an umbra, oh, right? It's an actual umbra, Yeah. Sorry. It would not, I would not be surprised if he, if he tossed this one as well. It's missing a one drop. It has the two enchantments. Right. You, you might be a little more likely to keep it on the draw. Yeah, but he, he's, on the, he's on the play here, though, since he, he, he lost that last game, so... On the play, I, I don't know if this is this is going to do it. And, it. and it's been challenging for him to get his auras to stick. Yeah, Shahar has some disruption in that field. So unlike Josh, where he knows they're going to resolve, Shahar actually can counter them. I don't know what I do in Reed's spot here. I, he, you know, he, he has to make this decision, but I, I, I really can't speculate. I, I, I think that's more likely than keeping. I, okay. I, I, I think I, what he's doing right there is letting channeling William Jensen Listening to what what would what would he do? What would he say to him? Do, do you think do you think Huey's watching? I, I don't know. <laughs> he might not. He might not have gotten up yet. Yeah, I, I think I, I think he said he was going to catch the rebroadcast <laughs> a, a, afterwards. You don't think he started testing for the next Pro Tour? No, no, no. You know he's probably going to go, but I, I, I don't know how much testing he's going to do. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we pulls this off, four. Gabriel Nassif, we've seen in the top eight of previous individual world championships, pulling off a win from four but on not the play. In, but not in a game five with everything on the line. No, not in the game <laughs> yeah. five, not in the final. I mean, against Nassif, I'm only going to five in game five of Kyoto. I'm the, I then lost very quickly, but... <laughs> I was just going to... I didn't want to mention and bring up little private griefs, but... All right. What is the four-card hand? You know, if there's a deck that can win all four cards, it's this deck. If it's land, boggle, next turn, keen sense, umbra, like Reed's well on his way to, you know, getting a head, get, making a headway in the game. That, that's a one land, three spell hand that you could... Draw a second land on turn two. Yeah. Let's not forget... Or draw a land after you can keen sense it. Yeah. Let's not forget that Shahar has lightning bolt in his opening hand, so it must be hexproof. 
that's really well, you the, know, only, only, the only one you know, drops in his deck are hex. Yeah, the one drops for sure. For but Dryad Arbor. If he yeah, starts it, getting, he's not getting a turn on Dryad Arbor one, here. <laughs> <laughs> one land, non Dryad Arbor. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four. Land, Keen Sense, land, Rancor. He so does have a. It's not the one drop, but I don't think that three cards is going to do it here. Yeah. He keeps and passes. Oh, that's Horizon Canopy. Yeah. Th this could end poorly for Reed if he if he decides to go for Dryad Arbor. Shahar does have the Lightning Bolt. He, 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 might, he might feel like he has to here, right? Like. Uh, well, against a tapped Steam Vents, I think at the very least, cycling a Keen Sense is kind of where you want to be here. And suddenly, it's gone very, very quiet. Well, I mean, Shahar's got to be a little bit excited about the prospect of... Of winning worlds? <laughs> oh, I'm saying also the, the idea that he, you know, there might be a... You know, he might be able to kill a Dryad Arbor with yeah. enchantment on I, it. I, I mean, if you're Shahar, seeing Reed go, no one drop, fetch Dryad Arbor, you're in the best possible world here, since Dryad Arbor is eminently killable, and there aren't very many spells Reed could play this turn that would protect it. 17. Keen Sense... It's at least card pair for Reed. Yeah. Card. Pass. Shahar gets Mana Leak. Another good draw here, but I think you don't want to give Reed the extra card. I think you'd rather just kill the kill the Dried Arbor before Reed has a chance to use it for mana. Mm -hmm. You could so just... You, so you would say just kill it now. Well, actually, no, Reed's, Reed's not tapping it. He's going to attack with it. So you could just play a land and pass and hope Reed enchants it again. I don't think Reed's likely to do that. I think Reed is the most likely to just attack with it and draw the lightning bolt that he probably suspects Shahar has. It's a core spirit dancer. Well, that that's a good enough play that if Reed really gets gets the read here, he can actually play core spirit dancer, play an aura, and just not even attack with the dryad arbor, just assuming it's going to get lightning bolt and that Shahar's waiting for that. That's a tough play to make, though, and I, I, I don't even know if it's a right one <laughs> against an unknown hand. You can also attack here, draw out the Lightning Bolt, and then play around Mana Leak. It plays around Mana Leak. It but plays, not Spell Snare. It plays into Spell Snare, but I don't think Reed's ever going to have an opportunity to not play into Spell Snare. Glade Cover Scout. Ranker it up. All right, so Reed's got that going. Shahar He's in business after a fashion. Shahar does have Engineered Explosives, though, and... That, that is, you know, like I said, the, his best card in the matchup, and he happened to have it in his opening hand against Reed's Mulligans. We asked earlier in the evening, why wouldn't you play this Hexproof deck? And Luis, you said, because sometimes it all goes wrong. Yeah. You mulligan and mulligan and mulligan, and you don't find the right parts of the deck. Shahar Shenhar has fought back from 2-0 down. I think you just want to explode the scout here. I mean, you, again, you don't need to use it right away, but there's really no advantage in uh, not playing the explosives. You don't, you don't want Umbra to come down. You don't want, you know, to lose to, <laughs> to, to Reed's two cards in hand. Shahara has the option to act, take three if Reed doesn't play anything and maybe try to ambush the Glade Cover Scout with the Restoration Angel. It looks like a, he's going to elect to do that. Just having taking three a turn while the Explosives on one does kind of time walk Reed. It makes it so Reed doesn't have as many good plays as he might previously. Say Reed has another one drop in hand, now he can't even play it. It also lets Shahar keep, keep mana up for counter spells to stop Reed from doing anything else. Shahar looking at five cards in hand. Reed, of course, down to just a couple. He's going to offer up a core spirit dancer. <laughs> Shahar's going to accept the offering, I suspect. <laughs> Mana leak. Back we go to Shahar. Land number four. Pass. Yeah, Shahar is firmly in control of this game. He, he has all the options and he has all the cards. Reed has drawn another Glade Cover Scout. And even if he suspects Restoration Angel, 
He can't play another one drop because of the explosives. Right. And if he doesn't attack, I, I don't know how he's winning the game. I mean, if he really has, you know, the sole read on Shahar that Shahar does have the angel, not attacking, you know, is acceptable. It's better for him if he doesn't attack. But in the dark, I, I just don't see how he, he can resist getting in for three. I don't know really know how he's winning the game against an explosives for one otherwise. Looks like he's just willing to bite the bullet here and does not want to concede to an angel. This gives Shahar the opportunity to explode the Glade Cover Scout but leave the, the one of the Rancors in Reed's possession. Mm -hmm. Pop it. So one comes back. Reed at 14. And Reed now has all the inf or Shahar now has all the information. Reed only has one card in hand. Shahar knows what it is, and Shahar can decide how he wants to take the game from here. He, he can also make that card go away if he wants. Yeah, he, he's I got... He, I believe he's got a Vendillion Click in hand. Yeah, he, actually, Shahar has it all. He's got Vendillion Click, Restoration Angel, Snapcaster, and Thundermaw Hellkite that he just drew. And Snapcaster, you know, conveniently enough, fetches Mana Leak, so... Shahar's, you know, got a lot of options here. Looks like he's just going to rumble for five. He's just going <laughs> to outrace three. Thundermaw Hellkite, in it comes. Nine. It's done a lot of work for Shahar over this tournament. That's a theory. Was that ethereal? It was. So, I mean, that, that's we have a race. One of one of, one of the cards Reed wanted to draw. This this could end end well for Reed. He's gonna he's got an uphill battle. But if his next draw is a coronet and Shahar doesn't keep Manalik up, that, which seems unlikely. It does. But I mean, Reed you doesn't have any options uphill. here. <laughs> so, here we go. Rancor onto Glade Cover Scout. Reed's at eight. Ethereal armor. Smash. Shahar draws. Snap cast the mage. He's going to show him. The applause has started. Reed Duke extends the hand, and it is Shahar Shenhar, the Israeli national champion, has led himself to victory here in the final of the world championship. He stands atop the world of magic. And at 19, Shahar Shenhar is king of the world. Wow, from 2-0 down, guys. Yeah, he just remained calm. Look. Uh, you know, <laughs> was in those first two games, I mean, as we watched them, yeah. both of the first two games that he lost, he could have won. Yeah. Th th those games were close. I mean, he, he did get read to two. He did have just a turn away from winning in the other game. Right, he was a so. Thundermaw Hellkite away. And, and a card that he brought in from his sideboard that maybe didn't seem intuitive in this matchup. Yeah, I think you do have to race there, though. You don't you don't really win by just taking your time and kind of controlling the game. Your your, your answers match up so poorly to Reed's threats. If you give Reed Duke a blank piece of paper tonight in his hotel room <laughs> and say what went wrong, I think it's going to be a pretty short list. It might just say I didn't win, which I guess is kind of the mistakes list you want. Well, I mean, that's that's not even a mistake, right? Like, you just want to play no, well. And, you know, if you win or lose is sort of beside the point from yeah, I, playing the best magic. I, I do around. think you want to divorce the results from the process because if the process is right and the results aren't there, they will eventually be there. You shouldn't right. change the process. An important lesson to, to take at home. If I've heard it one time, I've heard it a thousand <laughs> times from these guys. It's stopping so results-oriented, Brian. Yeah, maybe we should change the process of how we tell you because the results <laughs> haven't changed. <laughs> wow. I just, I just don't know how we've got here, really, because at 02, it looked so certain, really, that Reed, not just on the math of it, but he just seemed to be there. Um, so, fantastic stuff. Shahar Shenhar is your world champion. Let's head you back to the news desk. Award ceremony coming right up. It's Zach Hill and first Marshall Sutcliffe. Welcome back to your Marshall Sutcliffe. I am with Zach Hill, and you can see the Israeli flag flapping in the wind. That was a great finals, really, really sick stuff. It looked like Reed Duke had it locked up on uh, multiple occasions, and Shahar Shenhar was still able to pull it out. Yeah, I mean, Shahar Shenhar, you know, not the traditional way to defeat the Hexproof days. It D didn't draw, you know, and especially in game four, wasn't just answering everything, was able to ride back to back cryptic commands yes. off Snapcaster to kind of beat Reed the old fashioned way. Just uh, won the race. Yeah, it was insane, though, as we started to 
kind of count up the damage. Uh, you know, yeah. we were we were watching along. Like I said, you know, we, we sit over here in the desk waiting for things <laughs> to be over, but we're just like you. We went over to the TV right. over there and we watched the coverage on that because, of course, we're interested and want to see who wins as much as the next guy. And uh, yeah, fantastic stuff there from Shahar Shenhar. Let's talk a little bit about Reed, though. Second place finish here, nothing to be ashamed of there. Oh, I mean, not even close to anything to be ashamed of. To be one game away from running the world championships, obviously we've talked about a lot about the comeback, but just a really commanding performance today came in. Uh, one of the top seeds, you know, I mean, it really showed everyone kind of who was boss in the Swiss rounds and then played a very unconventional and what I believe is a very good deck choice for modern, especially over five games, um, you know. Everyone else was kind of playing these blue eye red control decks, and he said, you know, I'm going to take a different angle. I think I've got a deck that people are not going to be able to interact with. Um, kind of winning what everyone thought was a bad matchup uh -huh. against Josh Hutter Layton in the semifinals and losing what everyone thought was a pretty good matchup yeah. to Shahar in the finals. Yeah. All right. I am told that the award ceremony for the world championship is ready, so I'm going to send it over to Rich Hagen right now. Hello everyone and welcome to the awards ceremony for the World Championship 2013 for Magic the Gathering. It's time to bring on the champion, the man who gave us a pulsating final, the second time his country have given us a world champion. From Israel, please welcome your world champion, Shahar Shenhar. Shahar, great job. You're about to be mobbed by half of Israel, it seems. You've not just got your friends here, you've got your whole family with you. What does it mean to you? It means everything to me, you know? All my family supporting me here, it means really everything to me. What did it feel like at 0-2 down in the final against such a phenomenal competitor like Reed Duke? I mean, I was the underdog coming in, uh, you know. <laughs> I was just the underdog coming in. I had to follow through with my plan. I'm still a disbelief that it actually happened. I was such an underdog. I know you split your time between the United States and Israel. Would you like to say something, um, perhaps in not English, uh, to your friends and family back in Jerusalem? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your world champion for 2013, Shahar Shenhar. This brings our World's Week to an end. Five incredible days of magic. And it's going to head you back to the news desk, Marshall Sutcliffe. Wow, great stuff down there, Rich. That was absolutely fantastic to see to see Shahar down there win such a young guy, his whole family here supporting him. Really awesome. Let's talk about Reed a little bit more. We're actually going to get Shahar, and we're going to get the chance to have a chat with him directly. But until then, you know, I just want to kind of pay respect to what Reed accomplished uh, during the course of this weekend. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I, I've, I've been so impressed with Reed's play across multiple formats. I mean, we saw him play a deck that was really good, but really kind of a gimmicky deck, and it's it's tempting to say when you see something like that, okay, well, like, someone made it this far because they read the environment well. Let's not forget that Reed played a lot of formats, four different formats over the course of the World Championships, and, uh, you know, mastered them all. And yeah, really delivered commanding performances across the board. That's a really great point. I mean, we had M14 draft here. Yeah. We also had Modern Masters right. draft. These were tough draft formats. Now, now M14, it's a core set. You know, it's a little bit pared down, but still, it comes down to really strong technical play at the end yeah. of the day. And Modern Masters is pretty open. There's a whole lot going on in there, and it takes a lot of skill to master that. He did really well in those. Also, standard. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a really good point. I mean, it's, it's hard to overestimate how difficult it is to prepare at the highest level mm -hmm. for 
four different formats. <laughs> yeah. And to show up with deliberately thought out, very good decks for four different formats, especially when all the people that you're used to testing with and practicing with uh -huh. are your opponents. Yeah, that's the in tough this part, tournament. Right? <laughs> you know, you don't just get to lean on somebody to help you out. Now, I, I have a question about, yeah. about Reed Duke's deck choice here for Modern. Mm -hmm. Now, th this was the most important deck for the weekend. Remember, right. Modern uh, was also played in the Swiss, and then it was also the top four. So it was, there had to be a little more emphasis on that deck, you'd think, than on the others. Now, was do you do you view this as like a metagame call where Reed was uh, taking a shot, so to speak, that people were going to be playing certain types of decks? Oh, absolutely. I think he sees, uh, you know, anticipates a lot of people slinging Electrolyzes, Lightning Bolts, Path to Exiles, and Spell And he just wants to blank so, all yeah, of I'm them? I'm not interested in playing that game. All right, we've got Shahar Shenhar. Why don't we bring him in here right now? He's hey got guys. his trophy. Shahar, hey, Shahar. Congratulations. how you doing? Congratulations, congratulations man. This is <laughs> Why incredible. don't you take a seat there? You can grab your trophy and show it off to everybody so at home. Leave it here. Yeah, <laughs> that's nice. Shahar. Talk to us about the last couple of games there. The game four, very, very close. Uh, can you remind me real quick what happened game four? <laughs> so you cast a bunch of cryptic commands and then yes. you drew that lightning helix. All right, so that, I mean, I had electrolyzed too, but that yes. was part of the plan. Um, it, I was coming in a huge underdog. I mean, people were saying it's 95, 5%, and, and then Ifra was laughing and saying it's way worse. It's 98, 90, uh, 98, 2%. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I mean, but uh, we have a plan. We'll follow through and We'll hope for the best, and like you know, the plan is to play like Vendillion Click, Restoration Angel, mm -hmm. Blink it, take uh, you know, fog a little bit, and then Cryptic Command, Snapcaster Mage, Cryptic Command, and that's exactly what happened. That was the plan. That's exactly what happened. So, I mean, how did you come up with that? I mean, I know the temptation for me is, okay, I've got some really horrible matchup. I'm going to draw my cards and see what happens. And then, you know, it basically just kind of write the match off. I mean, were you saying, no, I'm going to dig up a way to figure out how to win this match? How much time did you spend developing that? Uh, actually, not so much. I, oh, yeah? I played <laughs> I played against... Uh, <laughs> I respect that. <laughs> I played against Reed, uh, against Reed. I think oh, it was really? round 13 at the Player Championship, and, like, he crushed me. Game one, you multi five, he still crushed me. Oh, yeah. Game two, I just died. Uh, BDM coming in is like, was it as bad as you thought? And I told him, uh, it was as bad as I thought, but I learned a lot, and that's when I learned the plan. That's really? when I learned like what I could actually do to win to win the match. So what was going through your head in game five? Reed Duke's mulliganing pretty severely. Yeah, and you, Yeah, and you had one of your key sideboard cards. You had engineered explosives. Yeah, <laughs> Did you feel like you had a pretty good shot at that I, point? Yeah, I'm gonna be honest. I felt, yeah, yeah. I I felt like I had a answer. huge shot and my heart was racing. Uh huh. I, yeah. It starts to become one of those scenarios where you're like, don't screw this up, Shahar. Don't screw this <laughs> up. Everybody's watching. But you didn't. You actually finished quite strongly, if I don't say so myself. And now you're the world champion at age 19, Shahar. I just have one more question for you. Sure. And maybe this is a selfish. This is how I'm. You have played so much magic. Over the course of the last several days, you were yeah. the captain of the Israeli national team. You played through the entire world championship. How were you able to keep up your focus after that much magic being played? Um, you know, I'm, I've just been sleeping a lot. <laughs> and thank God Ben hasn't w been waking me up during the night at all, because then I would just be crushed and I wouldn't be able to do this. But yeah, I've just been having a good night's sleep and eating breakfast every time. And you know, that's. And I have a, I apparently have a high stamina. And, and mainly <laughs> keeping Ben Stark quiet is uh, an no, achievement actually, in and yeah. of itself. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, he's I'll also 19, it. remember? Uh, yeah, yeah, it must be 19 nice. 19-year-olds yeah, can uh -huh. do this. They uh -huh. can just keep going through that. Yeah. Now, we saw uh, during the award ceremony, your family's here. How was that for you to have them with you to, when you won the world championship? And my family being here is everything. This is my biggest accomplishment. This is the first time they've actually been there when I've gotten the trophy. You know, the last three Grand Prix that have... Uh, than well at, um, mm -hmm. they just weren't there. Um, yeah. I came home and they were very happy for me, but it wasn't the same thing as it was now. It means yeah. everything. And it was so great to see you in yeah. the middle with everybody crowded around you. That must have been one of the great moments of your life so far. So far. Yeah. <laughs> you have a long way to go, don't <laughs> worry. Now, what about the people that you tested with? We saw a Tom Martell running yeah, there and kind of grab uh, your shoulders. Tom Martell is the only person who, oh, and a little bit of Willie Edo. Uh -huh. uh, we, we messaged a little bit uh, on Facebook and stuff. Like We shared some ideas, uh -huh. picked his brain a little. Um, but no, I tested with Tom Martell uh, and um, also David Shields and Matt Costa helped me a lot in uh, the blue, white, red standard mirror, I would mm. say. Not really modern, but like the standard. They really helped us tune the, the list and stuff. And we really, really appreciate that, both of us. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Now, when it came to the other format, so modern, 
seemed like it was the most important format as it was what was played in the top four. Yeah, it was. Did you put a lot more effort into the modern deck than you did the others? No. <laughs> you, you, you kept it about the same? Yes, I just kept, I, I, yeah, I kept it about the same. Because, I mean, you had two different limited formats to make sure that you were mm -hmm. up on. You had a standard deck that you needed to try to pick, and then you also had to pick your modern deck on top of it all. Yeah. That's a pretty tall order. Well, thank God I just played blue eye red in every, in every <laughs> format, and it worked out, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, is, that is your specialty, apparently, yeah. at this point, so that's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, I mean, uh, now, uh, you know, I normally think of Matt Coster or, like, Jerry or something as the go-to guy for blue eye red Fash, but I think you've successfully usurped that title. Uh, I don't think so. Oh, okay. Uh, I still ask them all the time, so I don't think so. Awesome. Yeah, now where are you going to put that trophy when you get home? Uh, I don't know. Are you going to? Somewhere. Is somewhere it going to be next to your pillow for the next few days? Somewhere in the room. Actually, uh, my last trophy is at Ben's house in Miami. He didn't bring it. I, I left it there. So. <laughs> ben gets to yeah. be your trophy case? Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to let him hold that one, though. No, he'll lose it, so no, I'm not going to let him touch it. <laughs> so, uh, so what are your next plans for Magic here? I mean, you... Uh... Uh, I'm actually going to Warsaw. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, next week, uh, Josh and Reed and I are staying here. Uh, for a week, and then we're gonna book the same flight and, and fly to Warsaw together. And that's standard? Yes, and yeah. I'm playing Blue Eye Red. You're gonna play Blue Eye Red, you already know it here. <laughs> Spoiler it's alert. Coming off of your world championship win, it should be good. So, yeah, uh, I think that we're ready right now, though, to end this mammoth mm. broadcast. We've been here for five days. There's been it's 71 been a countries. long week. Yeah. Shahar, congratulations again. Thank you. Everybody's again. proud of you. Great work. Thank you. Excellent work. All right, so why don't we throw it over now? to the wall. We have Rich and BDM waiting to wrap this whole thing up, put a bow on it, put a cherry on it, all the other things that go on it, and let's get out of here. <laughs>